first time I had the opportunity to speak in church, I was 12 years old, and um, I hope it's better than that. But every time before I speak, for the past hour and a half, I've been sitting there really feeling like at any moment I'm going to go into AFib. So I never get comfortable. My mouth will start sticking to the roof. My tongue will start sticking to the roof of my mouth. But here's the thing. Lord um, put a message on my heart. When Brandon asked me, I was like, how do you say no to that? And then the next week, he announced that we're going to one service, which I was like, well, that was, that was sneaky. Um, I like to have a small first service, sort of a practice warm-up. So if you guys want to hear a really good version of this, come back at 1 o'clock. We'll do it then. So, um, no, all kidding aside, I'm just so excited to be here. And just excited that we get to talk about the goodness of the Father. So, um, we were on a two-week break from Romans. We've been in Romans chapter 8, so we're going to take a look back before we can go forward. So, um, Paul is telling us in Romans 8, therefore, therefore as Christians, therefore as believers, that's who he's speaking to in Romans 8, that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He is speaking to the believers, Paul talks about how the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us. He goes on to tell us the great news that we are co-heirs with Jesus. He spurs us on by telling us that we did not receive a spirit of slavery to fear, but instead we have received the spirit of adoption. We are called sons and daughters, and that allows us to cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, to God. Romans 8 is about our position and our relation that we have with God as followers of Jesus Christ. This is such great news for us. Two weeks ago, Brandon walked us through verses 18 through 25, and it's in these verses that Paul lays out our glory, our future and current glory, glory as believers, as adopted children. These passages bring with them the promise of hope, a hope that comes from knowing We've been made alive from death to life, and that's the hope that we have, that we look forward to, that we hold on to. The hope in us is that Christ is in us, guaranteed, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and that what we go through, what we struggle with, we aren't alone. So that leads us into our verses for this morning. I came with a whole thing here, because I do, it's important to me that I read scripture from my Bible, but without my glasses, I can't read my Bible. So I know there's people in here that can relate to that. So we're going to go into Romans 8, 26 through 30. Follow along if you have your Bibles. I think it's up on the screen. I was like, I can't, look at that. I can't do that and do this. So here we go. Likewise, the spirit that helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All right. So we start off with the word likeness, or likewise. Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in weakness. This leads us back, I gotta get a drink of water, I'm sorry. Just like the Holy Spirit helps us in our suffering, those are the verses that Brandon was talking about, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. A lot of times weakness and suffering go hand in hand. So we're going to look at that, that likewise. In our weakness, in our weakened state, it is not in our power, in our own strength, in our control to help ourselves. 
Without the hope of salvation, without the assistance of the Holy Spirit, we are helpless and hopeless. The verse goes on and says, we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I love how the Spirit works, the songs that we sang this morning. We talked about that. Some of you sitting here right now as I'm saying the words too deep for words, you feel yourself losing your breath because that is the situation that you are in. What does the weakened state look like? For some of you here today, it's a situation where you don't even know the words to pray. You're at a loss. What gets us to this weakened state? There's so many things. Infertility, loss of a child, in utero or out, a medical diagnosis, a prodigal child, anxiety, depression, job loss, financial struggle, estranged relationships with family, church hurt. I've had experience with a number of these, but I'm gonna specifically talk to you today right now about something that happened to me in the summer of 2011. My husband at the time um, came home and decided to tell me that he was having an affair. At the time, I literally felt like someone had punched me in the stomach and I could not catch my breath. But I knew God was going to restore my marriage, he was going to heal it, and we were going to go around and speak at marriage conferences all over the world. But he walked out the door of our house and never spoke to our children again. I was struggling to get through the days. I found myself needing to catch my breath through a straw. I love that song about breath. That's where my anxiety takes place. I feel like I cannot breathe. I literally would carry a straw in my car, so when I was like, oh, I can't breathe, I would just breathe through a straw, breathe through a straw, it's gonna be okay. For months, I prayed for reconciliation. And it, when it became clear that that was not going to happen, I was at a loss. What now? Where is my hope? How is this situation that Paul's talking about? How is this struggle different? How is this different than the things that I pray for? If I'm to be honest, a number of the things that I pray for are not so dire. The situations that I take to the Father, he loves those. I'm not saying stop praying. I'm saying he wants to be in every detail of your life. But they're not so desperate. Maybe a situation where I was all the way up in North Orange County and I was praying and asking if I should take a job in South Orange County. Now, I know for some of you that seems silly, but when your whole life and world is up there, so I take that to the Father and what do I do? I seek his word, I ask for his will, I check with other people. Can you be praying for me with this in this? Last summer, we spent time in the Sermon on the Mount. It was life-changing for me. I've been a Christian for 50 years. I know some of you are like, wow, she looks like she's 30. How is that even possible? <laughs> Thanks. Um, but I really got so much out of that sermon. And when Jesus says, pray like this, your will be done. If I'm to be honest, oftentimes when I pray, I gave God the playbook and say, here's how we're going to run it, Right? And in those situations, it's kind of okay. But that's not what Paul's talking about today. He's talking about being in a situation where you don't even have any clue as to what to pray for. What if I find myself in a situation where I can't make sense of anything that is happening? Maybe your situation today is infertility. For years, you've been trying to conceive a child. You have the deepest longing for a child the monthly reminder that you are not pregnant, the doctors are confused by your inability to conceive, the tension that happens between you and your spouse. Day after day you've been praying, month after month, you've asked, you've petitioned, you have no words left. You're desperate. Sorry. Maybe this is you. You have a prodigal child, right? You've raised them in the church. Proverbs 22, 6 says, raise up a child in the way that they should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And you did this, 
And you have been praying and praying and waiting and watching, and they are struggling. You have no more words to pray. What else is there to be said? Or maybe this is you. You or someone you love is dealing with debilitating anxiety and depression. Do we do counseling? Do we do EMDR? Do we do medication? You've prayed over the house. People have come in and prayed. People that have never walked with someone in this, they'll say, oh, is today a good day or a bad day? But my friends, if you have experienced this or walked with someone who has, it is good hour and bad hour. We can't even look at the day. It's breakfast. I can't even think about lunch. For some of you, that's where you're at. We have a heavenly father that understands this pain. You are not alone. Jesus, our savior, has experienced this. When he was on the road to go see Mary and Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, right? And he meets them and they are weeping. And Jesus wept. Jesus didn't weep because he was sad that Lazarus died. He knew he was gonna raise him. He wept because the friends that he loved were distraught. And I'm here to tell you today, to remind you today, that he cries when you are distraught. The Holy Spirit weeps with you. The Holy Spirit is in it with you. In the garden, Jesus himself experienced this desperation that we're talking about today. In Luke 22, 42, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Not my will be done, but yours. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. God sees you. He sent a helper for you. Luke 24, 49 says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. The helper is here. He is with me. He is with you. He is in me. He is in you. He groans on your behalf to the Father with words we cannot understand. Verse 27 says this, and he who searches hearts know what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is where we get to see the character and nature of our God. These are the things that we hold on to when we are in the struggle. Everything around you might feel chaotic. The walls are closing in. Wave after wave, you come up and another one slaps you in the face. But God does not shift. He is not moved about by our storms. He is steadfast, he is kind, he is loving, and he is present. This is such great news. The Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. He pleads on our behalf according to the will of the Father. He is in it with you. This is where the Holy Spirit pleads to the Father. They know our hearts. They know our hearts better than we do. They prioritize. They see big picture. We see the now. I'm so grateful that we have an intercessor who aligns my needs and wants with the will of God. Verse 28 goes on to say this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We have a tendency in the church, when someone's going through something really hard, it makes us feel really uncomfortable. I'm a fixer, I wanna fix it. I can fix a lot of things. They let me run a school. <laughs> Problem solve, pivot on a daily basis, wind, rain, all of it, right? But we like to throw out things like, oh, you'll get beauty from ashes, right? <laughs> God's gonna work all of this good for good to those who are, according, who are called according to his purpose. Those are truths. But when you're in that, it doesn't always help. Some of you, and I am so sorry, for some of you, the good that Paul is talking about, you will never see that this side of heaven. But he will use it. Let's look at what this verse is not saying. This verse is not saying that all things are currently good. 
that's not true today, it's not going to be true tomorrow, it's not going to be true until we're in heaven. All things in the garden were good, and then sin entered, and it has never been the same. But remember this, if it's not good, God's not done with it, right? Right? All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Brandon talked a couple weeks ago um, about a frequent topic. And I hear this all the time for Christians. Like, if God is so good, Marnie, why does he let good things hap- bad things happen to good people? It's a good question. There's several answers. One is, no one is good but God. Yes, there are kind people, there are generous people, there are loving people. But Luke 18, 19 through 20, Jesus says, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. Number two, we have free will. I love my free will. You love your free will too. But it causes problems. My free will can cause bad situations in my life. Your free will can cause bad situations in my life. But I'm so thankful that we have a loving father who doesn't force us into relationship with him, but we have a choice and we have free will. So you can't have one without the other, so there's free will that can cause horrible situations. I love this verse when we're talking about this topic. In John 9, we hear the disciples ask Jesus this question. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Sometimes we think that, right? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, listen, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. That is the truth. Yes, sometimes my sin brings about consequences, but we must remember that the blood of Jesus covers all of my sin, covers all of your sin. His love is a redeeming love. So if you're sitting there today and you're thinking, I'm not worthy of this, that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. God's sin, I mean, sorry, Jesus' blood covered your sin yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we need to, as believers, start walking out in that freedom. Here's the last one I'm going to talk about. We have a very real enemy. I don't like to talk a lot about Satan. It's just like, I don't like to give him a lot of attention. But there is a battle. Battle, keeping you tied, keeping you from wanting full freedom in who you are in Jesus Christ. And you need to be aware of that. I've seen it in people. Because we serve a God who is a promise maker, we can rest knowing that he is a promise keeper. He promises to work all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Let's take some time to look at good in this verse. Oftentimes, our good is not God's good. You're like, what? I'm a Christian. We have to be the same. No. His ways and thoughts are so superior to mine. I am so grateful that I have a God that I cannot rationalize with. Like, he's like, no, I know. He is so far superior because when you're in a pit, you need someone who is far superior than what you can bring to the table. Oftentimes, our good is not God's good. Isaiah 55, 8 through, 8 through 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sermon on the Mount again, the upside down kingdom. Once we're followers of Jesus Christ, each day, this is really going to bother some of you, each day our goal should be to allow God to use us to bring other people to Jesus. That's it. Submit and have your way in me. In December of 2012, I was Skyping. Do people still Skype? Is that still a thing? Just, yeah. I was Skyping with my daughter, Marley. She was in Australia, serving with YWAM, a Christian organization, Youth with a Mission. And we were just talking about all my current struggles, filing for divorce, financial instability, childhood trauma, rejection from the church, you know, a 
light laundry list of things. Um, and she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, Mom, do you even like your life? My response to her was that it's not about liking my life. It's about living a life that God can use to walk with my brothers and sisters in Christ in their trials. This liking of my life, our life, that is where we need to look at liking and good. Yes, God wants us to like our life. I love my life. I love what I get to do. I love that we're doing this. I love my life. But things haven't always turned out the way I've planned them. But if I look at the world, I look at all you going on your European vacations all the time, it's hard for me to like my life. But when I measure it to what the Lord is saying a truly blessed, fulfilled life is, I am blessed beyond measure. Hmm. How do you get to that place? It doesn't come easy. It's not on the mountaintop. So there was about a period of a year and a half. I'm going to take a drink of water. This is a great story. Okay. <laughs> Desert, like in my mouth right now. There was a period of about a year and a half where all of this was going on in my life. It was kind of a dropping like, of all of the things. I was in a desperate place, just asking God for manna, right? My daily to get through the day. If I look too far ahead, if I look to tomorrow, if I look through to Friday, I could find myself caught up in a full-blown panic attack, unable to breathe. Where's the straw? The paper bag, right? Instantaneous cold sweat. What I do want to tell you is I was completely functioning. I was working at a school. I was going to work. I was going through my grind. You know it. You do it. We're doing it. And you're here today, and you're like, oh, my gosh. I have a straw in my car. I get that. That's the thing, right? As I continued, to, as I continued with my therapy and pressed into a new loving church community, spent hours on end reading God's word. I'm just going to tell you right there. I'm going to stop right there. If you're struggling, crack open God's word. It never turns away void. I don't care. When you're like, where should I read? I don't crack it open. Just start reading it. It gives life. That's the way he created it. It breathes life into you. So I was spending hours on end reading God's word, praying and listening. And I felt myself being put back together. I felt God telling me it was time to leave the desert. I don't want to leave the desert. I was so comfy there. Had a little stream, little blanket, little cover. It was so great. He was like, go join in. Go join in the fun again. Be part of society. Go do what you're going to do. But I resisted. Because I knew that on the other side of my desert, my full dependence on the Father was self-sufficiency. I had found my identity completely in who God says I am. During that season, God would speak over me again and again, and he would say, Marnie, you are a chosen princess of the reigning king. In all of this circumstance, all of this is happening to you. It is not your identity. It is not your reality. It is situational circumstance. Right? Y'all are clapping, but do you wear that identity? You are a chosen prince or princess of the reigning king. If we lock eyes with Jesus like Peter did when he was walking on the storm, and we lock eyes with him and we're like, this is who I am. Then when something really bad happens or some irritating situation, it doesn't define us. We continue focused on the Father. When, and when all of that happens, we can look directly into the face of the Father and find a joy that goes beyond any understanding. As long as we continue to find, define what the good is in this verse, in the eyes of the world, we will never receive the hope and freedom that is intended from the scripture. What is this hope and freedom? A hope in knowing that we are not doing this alone, that the Holy Spirit is with us every step of the way. A freedom that comes from full submission to God. I know you all capable people, putting it back together. But when the Lord gets you to a place where you cannot contribute, that is when he has you fully. When we submit, it is a beautiful, 
beautiful thing. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. It's in these verses that we get a behind, scene, behind the scenes look at what God is up to. We are chosen by God. I'm going to stop there. I felt like Holy Spirit told me today, this morning. Yes, I hear from him. He doesn't call me, but I hear from him. You can hear from him too. That there are people in the room that don't believe that they have been chosen by God because their earthly father did not treat them as if someone who were to be chosen. And he told me, if we don't do business with that, everything else I'm talking about is falling on deaf ears. So I'm here to tell you that the way your earthly father or your earthly mother or whoever it was cared for you has absolutely no bearing on how the father loves you. He loves you. He chose you. He knew us before we were even a thought to our parents. He conformed us to the image of his son. Everybody's like, I want to be like Jesus. How do we become like Jesus? Through sanctification. You're like, hard pass. No. Sanctification, when we go through the trial, that is how we become like Jesus. We don't sign up for it, but we do enter into a relationship, and God is going to transform us. Not only did he choose us, he has called us, called us into relationship with him. Once we enter into that relationship, we are justified, not by anything that we can say or do, but we are justified by the blood of Jesus. He alone justifies. And because of his justification, we can rest in his glory. Yes, we can talk about how we will be glorified in heaven, but we as believers can taste that glory earthside by experiencing the joy and peace that comes from knowing God and knowing we belong to Him. I gotta, I gotta pick it up. How do I know this? I've seen it in my own life. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. But at the age of eight, I told my mom I wanted to know about Jesus. That's the called part. I started attending church with my aunt, and I fell madly in love with Jesus and his church. I've had my own share of struggles, and you've heard some of them. But really, the testimony God has knit together with my life is a beautiful tapestry. Situations where I did not know how to pray, I did not have the strength, and I cried out to the Holy Spirit for his help. Divorce, childhood trauma, anxiety. What I can tell you is this, that it didn't always look like a Hallmark movie. I love watching Hallmark because I don't like stress when I'm watching TV. I already know how it's going to end before it even starts, right? I'm like, okay. Gets a little, you know, oh, they didn't get the plane ticket or something. You get a little, ah, but you know it's all going to work out. (laughs) What I can tell you is that I have seen the good that is promised in these verses. I have seen the face of God in ways that I never would have without my trials. An example of this is my adult children. I have a daughter who's going to be 32 this week and a son who's 30. And they kind of watched me go through all of this. They were old enough to understand everything that was going on. They were raised in the church. My husband and I were in ministry the whole time we were married. Um, And on my 50th birthday, we were sitting around just talking about how basically the goodness of God and what he's brought our family through. And my children shared with me that night that the reason they have faith in God like they do, the reason they continue to pursue a relationship with Jesus had nothing to do with anything that they learned at Daisies or Royal Rangers or Youth Convention, but it was because of the way God carried me through that season. And I will tell you right now, I would do that again for that reason. So you don't know what the outcome is of your struggle. But I'm here to tell you, it will be good. Please hear me. I'm not up here standing here telling you about my trials so you can think I'm this strong survivor. I'm sharing these things so we can make some sense of our trials. 
The trials that get us to a place where we are so weak, we don't have words to pray. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11 says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, this part's fun, huh? I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, and in persecution and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So in closing, let me summarize so you can have a few takeaways. One, we have a Holy Spirit in us. He will be with us in all things. He's an advocate for you in your weakness. God will use all things for good, yes, all things, for those of us that are in relationship with him. Remember, the definition of good here is kingdom-driven. The cross was the worst day in history, if we look at it that way through the eyes of the world. But it is the best day in our story. That's the perspective. Number three, God's steadfast love is seen in a way he ch- in, the, in the way that he chose us, called us into relationship with him, paid the price for our sins, and allows us to participate in his glory. Getting ready to close. One of my favorite things about Mountain View Church is how it feels like family. It reminds me so much of the church that I grew up in. And I want to encourage you not to walk through your struggle alone. It is very helpful to borrow one another's faith. And what I mean by that is find someone who has gone through the struggle that you are going through, and they can help you get to the other side. So here's my question. Where is God meeting you today? What is the Holy Spirit stirring in you, prompting in you? You see, God never wants us to come into a Sunday morning worship service and leave the same way. He has something for everybody. Not because I'm this great speaker, but that's how the Holy Spirit works. So maybe you're in a pit, barely hanging on. I want to encourage you to ask for prayer today. There'll be people on the sides for prayer. I'll pray for you, the neighbor next to you. Prayer. We're going to pray. Maybe you have past hurt that you have shoved down deep and white-knuckled, and never allowed the Lord to have his way with it and make what he wanted out of it. And I'm going to ask you today to be vulnerable and bring that to the Father. Because you don't think that affects you? It affects you. Maybe you have one foot in the door of following Jesus and one foot following the world. That doesn't work. Bible says he'd rather spit you out than be lukewarm. But I'm here to tell you that the all in is the only thing that's worth it. Maybe today you're gonna make a commitment to go all in. Maybe today you're gonna recommit to going all in. I know, I know, narrow road, wide road, narrow road. It's It's a process. But today, make the decision, I'm all in. I'm not holding back. I wanna be like that crazy lady up there. Right? Because it's the only thing in my life that has been worth it. Maybe you've never accepted the free gift of salvation and the Lord is pursuing you. (laughs) I used to pray for my kids, such an awful prayer. But when they weren't doing what I knew that they should be doing, I would pray, God, pursue them like a lion pursues its prey. If the worship band could come up. I thought maybe they were there. Uh, (laughs) So into this, right? Um, I want us to linger. I don't ever want church to be like, check, I'm running out. Because I truly believe Holy Spirit wants to do something in each and every one of your hearts and minds. I don't know what it is. I don't need to know what it is. You can take communion by yourself with a friend. For those of you that have been through the pit, maybe go back with the person sitting next to you and say, let's talk about our Ebenezers. Let's talk about all the things that God has brought us through. They're going to lead us in a song. 
And I'm just going to pray right now, and um, just going to pray that you receive from the Father what he has for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the words that Paul has written. We can assume that the pits are coming, the trials are coming. That's why that's in there. But God, we thank you for Holy Spirit. We thank you for the way that he, he ministers to us, the way he pleads on our behalf. Father God, I just pray for every person in this room right now that you would just give them what it is that you want to say to them. If you want to remind them that they're chosen, if you want to remind them that they're free, if you want to meet them in their pain, Father, I just pray that you would have your way in us, God. We submit, we submit to you. Have your way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.